friends. Welcome back to Chew, Sip, Repeat. Today, I'm happy to be sitting next to one of my most favorite humans on the planet. She is an extremely talented chef that I have been a huge fan of for many years. The only time I've been slightly upset with her is when she took a hiatus from cooking and decided to be a bartender. <laughs> <laughs> She has worked as a line cook and an executive chef at some of Tulsa's staples. Her cooking career has landed her on multiple cooking shows and taken her all over the United States and even Canada. In her most recent culinary adventure, she has founded and is the executive director of a nonprofit here in Tulsa. Welcome, Chef Nico. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so when did we meet? I think. Oh, my gosh. I um, feel like... 2008, nine? I thought it was more like, yeah, I guess 2008. Yeah. Because I was at Lola's at the Bowery. That's, yes, <laughs> yes. I had left the Petroleum Club um, to go be the sous chef at Lola's. Yes. Um, yeah, and at, that was at the same time that, like, I had been there maybe a few months and that was when Soche was closing. Oh wow. Okay. So it must have been right? 2009 then. Was it 2009? Yes. Because Did Soche close in 2009? Maybe I was I don't there in know. 2008. I know I met you guys when Soche was closing. Yes. And I couldn't, yeah. When Sho Soche closed, I was at Arnie's. Okay. So and I started there I think in 2009. So yeah, it had to I have been. It was. Yeah. Well, let's back up a little bit. <laughs> I have some questions that I want to ask you, not because I don't know the answers to them, but because I want people to understand a bit more about your history and know who you are and where you've come from and just get to know you a little bit better. So is Tulsa your hometown? It is not originally. I guess I say it is now because um, yeah. I've been here since 2006. But um, I was born in Bakersfield, California. Okay. And we moved around quite a bit. So, I, you know, lived in Bakersfield for a number of years, moved to Northern California for like elementary school years, and then went to middle school and high school in um, like Phoenix, Scottsdale, Arizona area. And it was because your dad is in oil, yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We kind of like commiserated about that. It's like being yeah. an oil brat versus being an army brat. Right. Like we just... Instead of bases, we got transferred to refinery cities. So. Right. <laughs> and so when did you move to Tulsa? So I moved to Tulsa. I moved to Oklahoma originally in 2003. To Bartlesville. Um, to Bartlesville, yes. which is where my parents live still. And then, um, you know, I was living in Bartlesville, had met like a really great group of friends and um, was doing a lot of driving back and forth to Tulsa from Bartlesville because, mm -hmm. you know, Bartlesville, it's a little better nowadays, but it's yeah, still, it's, it's grown. Still, it runs its, it runs its charm out and you have to come to the big city of Tulsa <laughs> for the, all the excitement. <laughs> and so it was funny to listen to you and Tack talk and like mention the Continental because that was one of the big places that I would be driving to like twice a week because Tuesdays and Thursdays were jazz jam. And I was really good friends with um, guys from this band, the Hamilton that started in Bartlesville that is now members of Jacob Fred jazz odyssey and like, Oh Holm yeah. Holmesy here and there. And like, so yeah, I was traveling with all those folks to Tulsa for jazz nights and then, you know, inadvertently being exposed to like the very little start of cocktail culture in Tulsa <laughs> right. yeah, with Tony and, um, Tony Collins. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't I definitely wasn't in any position to have any kind of like enlightenment as far as that went, because I was like sneaking in the back door and trying to get the band to go get free beers so that I could ask <laughs> free beers. Um, and then like praying that my car made it back to Bartlesville. In oh the my gosh. Of the night, which one of the times it did not. Oh my so, gosh. So like it was a tumultuous time, but I absolutely loved the Continental. And that was kind of what drew me to Tulsa was like, this is really dumb that I'm driving back and forth every day. Why don't I just get a job here? Right. And I eventually like lost my job in Bartlesville and decided, well, if I'm going to get another job, I might as well just 
get it in Tulsa. Make the start in Tulsa. So was the Petroleum Club then your first industry job? No. Okay, where Um, was your first industry job? So, I mean, industry job, I started when I was 17 in front of the house Okay, as a hostess. And my first job was supposed to be at like a New Orleans themed, I forget the name of it, um, but it was like a New Orleans themed chain restaurant, kind of like Bourbon Street or something like that. Uh But this was in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, And I had a friend that worked as a hostess there and was always like having this, such a great time and going out and drinking with all the older, you know, <laughs> restaurant people and friends that she was making friends with. And, uh, it just seemed very exciting and fun and a lot more fun than my like kennel assistant job, which was very like, that was what I was doing in high school was I worked at a veterinary hospital and it was actually a very solid career path that probably would have led me to a very like <laughs> stable and reliable um, source of income. Nine but to five. of course I didn't want that. I wanted no. like some kind of excitement and danger. And so I the lure of the industry. got a job as a hostess with my friend and then the restaurant immediately shut down before I could even start work. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, hmm, this um, should have been like a major red flag that maybe <laughs> the restaurant industry is not the most like reliable source of income. But uh, I immediately got another job at another restaurant and it was a place called Mezcal. Oh, yes. Um, which um, I think was a place like really ahead of its time. It was like authentic Oaxacan cuisine, a whole Mezcal menu. Um, and this and was I what, like that. 2000 and... That was 2002? Yeah. So yeah, yeah I would say that that was pretty ahead of its time. For yeah, sure. it definitely was. Um, and it was pretty popular. Um, it, it didn't, it didn't, you know, last. It's, it's not there anymore, but um, it was there for a while. And I really loved it. I started as a hostess and worked my way up to like bar backing. And I, my goal had been to be a bartender. Um, <laughs> and... I kind of just was chasing money at that point, you know, like that's when you're in your early, you know, I, well, I was in my teens. So I was like, you know, the second I turned 18, I was able to bar back because you had to be 18 to serve Mm -hmm. alcohol in Phoenix. Um, and so, yeah, I like worked my way, um, to different jobs, just hearing like, oh, they're making, you know, so-and-so money per night at the vine in Tempe. And so, oh yeah. You know, I'd quit one job and like go <laughs> be a surfer somewhere else. On the hunt for the Just money. always chasing it. And um, so I, I worked front of the house for the longest time until. Um, How did you make the transition into the back of the house where you shine so well? <laughs> it's funny because my mom was always the one, like, especially when I moved, you know, I fell on some hard times and needed to move back in with my parents to like save up some money. That's like the story of how I ended up in Oklahoma was they had gotten transferred when I was in high school Mm -hmm. and I, you know, it was my senior year and they were moving to Oklahoma and I was like already enrolled at Arizona state. I had a job. I had my own apartment. I was like, bye. Like I'm not (laughs) not going to Oklahoma. That's lame. Um, but then, you know, I ended up being like 19 years old and can't pay my bills and lost Mm -hmm. my job. And it was a really bad market and like no one would hire me. And so I ended up, um, supposed to be coming to Bartlesville to live for three months and save up some money um, and then move back home to the Valley. And once I got here, I just, um, I didn't want to leave. I met really wonderful people and I got, you know, kind of settled back in and liked being around my family and having that support system. And so I just stayed. Um, And, you know, there's so much more to that, but job wise, like, you know, I, I just spent many years, like all throughout my twenties of like resisting the industry, you know, like I would, I would work, you know, all the way up to like being a restaurant manager, you know, being the floor manager or, you know, whatever it was, shift lead, um, at front of the house or working as a barista and making salads Mm -hmm. at like coffee shops and stuff like that in Bartlesville. And, um, 
the, you know, the money was always just really unreliable working for tips, you know, very stressful, yeah. especially when you are very irresponsible. Um, <laughs> and so I, you know, eventually, you know, my mom was always whispering, like, you should go to culinary school. You should do, you know, you sh you've always been a good cook and you love to cook. And it would be like a steadier, like actual career path rather than, you know, right. Um, the instability. And I was just constantly like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But I did, you know, I always really enjoyed being in the kitchen. Like that was where right. all the dirty jokes were. That was where everybody <laughs> was having the most fun. Um, that was where you could be loud and crass. And, um, you know, that was like the, you know, the pirate ship. Like oh, yeah. That's, you know, and Absolutely. then you have to go out in the front and just be all nice. Mm -hmm. And then like you get to come into the back and be like, oh, you yes. know. <laughs> yes. So the back was always like had that draw for me. And when I moved to Tulsa in 2006, I initially uh, worked at P.F. Chang's, uh -huh. <laughs> which was its own kind of adventure. And then, um, you know, a bunch of other stuff, you know, like um, I worked at Doubletree um, at the front desk and I worked like the, the first shift where I had to be there at like 6.30 in the morning. Uh -huh. I didn't have a car, so I took the Tulsa like city bus to double tree there are worse ways of getting no, there so. um, but it really didn't work very often um, <laughs> and so yeah it was terrible and I was not good at that so I finally um kind of broke down and was like okay well you know I I've made salads and stuff at at the coffee shops and I've you know been in restaurants long enough I'm pretty sure I could cook you right know, it doesn't look that hard yeah so, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of like weaseled my way into a job um, at Petroleum Club. And that was 2000. So your first seven. step into the kitchen was Petroleum Club. And then you were hired that was as my first the sous chef yeah. <laughs> at Lola's. Yeah. Next. No, no, that was insane. That's a pretty. It was a big jump. Yeah. And, like Petroleum Club really was like uh, my boot camp, you know, because that was my first real like real kitchen job where there was like the hierarchy of chefs. There was, you know, there was a sous chef, there was an executive chef, there were line cooks that were in charge of certain stations. And so I kind of really learned that, um, you know, that kind of almost, you know, the military brigade system right. that kitchens were run under. Right. And so I started out as like the garde manger, working the pantry station, basically making salads, plating mm -hmm. desserts. And um, I think the chefs could see that like I did have creativity, you know, like I was. There was potential there. There yeah. was potential. And, you know, I picked up on things quickly and, um, you know, I would get to like make whatever kind of pasta salad I want wanted for like the big buffets that we would do at Petroleum <laughs> Club. And I would like just go wild with it. And um, they could see that like it was something that. I was picking up quickly. And right. so I just kind of rose in the ranks at that kitchen very rapidly. Like, you know, the turnover in a professional kitchen is often very high, very high. So, you know, or it would be like, you know, one guy would just like get locked up over the weekend and like, there's no <laughs> one, there's no one to work the grill. And I'll be like, well, I've been standing next to the grill for four months. I'll do it. Right. And yeah, I just kind of like grill threw is myself a hard in. station. That is intimidating. Oh, it's right. always been my favorite. Like I like to saute and everything, um, but grill has always been my favorite. Fast forward, probably an indication of your love for open fire cooking. Definitely. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But there was something about like putting like perfect little X's on a steak, like sure. the rotation and then just like the, I don't know, I, I just grilling. Grilling's where. Grilling's your jam. Grilling is my jam. <laughs> That's my favorite. I miss grilling on a regular basis, you yes. know, like the, that line station was always my favorite, but yeah, then, um, you know, that like youthful ambition thing where, you know, I think of the world. Mine, yeah. Yeah. And a friend of mine, um, Jacob Ide was, um, running the kitchen at Lola's, mm -hmm. um, as the head chef under, you know, Lola herself. Right. And he needed a sous chef and, we knew each other, I think, really from like the music scene in Tulsa. Oh yeah, Jacob's going to, always been a big yeah, music just guy. going to shows and so just so people and stuff. know what is Lola's. What was Lola's? Lola's, um, gosh, it it kind of had like a Spanish tapas vibe, mm -hmm. but 
it was very much Lola's own vision because right. there was also like this Southwestern, like um, Santa Fe influence mm-hmm. mixed in from her background. And, um, you know, she had this like Dia de los Muertos vibe. Yes, that very much. Infused everything there. Didn't and she so, have a, um, what do they call those cars? She drove a hearse. Yes. Yeah, she drove a hearse with like the Day of the Dead Katrina <laughs> on the back of it. And, right. And, yeah, and it was very much my aesthetic. Like oh, I, absolutely. Lola and I got along like gangbusters. She actually was originally from Bartlesville and like used to work at um, at the funeral home there. And so she just had like this really artistic, macabre, gothic, but then with like southwestern and Spanish uh-huh. food vibes. That right. I was like, well, this is my home. This right. is exactly. <laughs> it like, was. I really loved the. F- you know, the food um, that I got to experiment with there. Right. And just so people are aware, because obviously it is no longer mm-hmm. around, but the location of this is where the tavern is currently. Yes. Yeah. So originally that, I mean, not even originally, it's been, you know, it's like a historic building. So it's been so many different <laughs> things, you know, it is haunted as fuck. And really? Oh, yes. And oh. so it was the Bowery, which was like a nightclub. Yes, I do and remember so then it hearing became about that. Lola's at the Bowery. Uh-huh. And there was a stage, like that's where I first got introduced to like Branjay and Charlie Red would play there. Oh, yes. I yeah. do remember and, that. And um, oh my gosh, so many Tulsa musicians that are still playing and incredible today. But like it, there were, um, you know, there was a lot of jazz and you know, hip hop and R&B stuff going on there. Again, just really ahead of its time, I think. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, we could go on and on about I know. <laughs> uh, Lola's and or the Continental, which by the way, was a craft cocktail bar before craft cocktail bars were a thing here in Tulsa. Yeah. And it was on this side of McNelly's downtown. Where and it was like a tiny little bars there. Yes. Yeah, right? It was a tiny little place and it had like these crescent booths and they were it was just it was all like blue velvet and yeah, blue lights. It was and just, it was sexy. Oh, oh it was dope. I loved that place. Yes. I felt like the coolest when I was hanging out there. <laughs> yes. And this is, believe me, I was I was not. <laughs> I was I doubt it. I doubt it. I'm no, always it was not super cool. It was not cool. Um, so I'm interested in hearing more about the behind the scenes of all your TV adventures. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, Where was the first TV show that you went on? So I guess the first one. Um, and Channel 8 and Channel 6 and things like that don't make, don't count. They don't, cut, they don't make the cut. We're no. Red. <laughs> and actually I did like Food Network before I think I was even ever on local news. Which That's is hilarious. Weird. That is so funny. But it was, um, you know, I'd been at Lucky's for a while and Mm -hmm. I left Lucky's in 2014 to open Mixco with with Ryan Stack and Jared Jared Jordan, Jordan. um, which are, you know, just the old school homies. That's like the whole little Mm -hmm. crew of industry people that we like all got to come up with. And so they, you know, wanted to open this craft cocktail mixology type of bar. Right. And I, you know, had been just feeling the burnout a while at Lucky's, you know, the management side of things really makes it difficult to stay like creative and and, and inspired and passionate. And so I was like, I just really need a change. And they had approached me about just consulting or basically doing some charcuterie, cheese and charcuterie boards for the bar. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And also like, what else do you want me to do? (laughs) Because I kind of really want to try something else. And I, you know, going back to like when I was 18, being a bar back, I like always really wanted to explore bartending. Well, I just want to go on the record and say, it's not that you were a bad bartender by any means as to why I was mad at you because you were an excellent bartender. However, I just really (laughs) missed you cooking. Yeah. 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 It did. It was really, I really needed that like hiatus and it was really good for me to like miss it, you know? Yeah. And to be inspired by like different flavors and like 
all of my cocktails started to like taste <laughs> like they all started to become very savory. You know, I was like, why don't you just make some soup, girl? Like, stop yeah. making this like roasted garlic, like chicken broth, Manhattan, Manhattan like <laughs> martini. That was a real thing. I, I bet you it was delicious. It was good. Matt Land and I made that up. It was called the um the uh Oh my gosh, what was it? The Santa Carla Sunrise? <laughs> you're, like Lost Boys yeah. is set in Santa Carla, a right. fictional uh, Cher- or Cherokee, uh, um, fictional California town and um, infested with vampires. And right. So it was like a roasted garlic, garlic. martini. Right. I thought Sunrise. it was delicious. I it's get definitely it. not something that you would. Um, I don't know. I don't even I know infused, how I'm talking about that. But I infused vodka with pepperoni one time. And the only, <laughs> the only thing it was remotely yeah. good for was a Bloody Mary. Oh, obviously. <laughs> that was it. Like, so no, it no. sat on my shelf for forever because I don't particularly care for Bloody Mary. So it just. <laughs> Pepperoni. <laughs> it was, vodka. Yeah, it was not, it was not my the brightest idea. I have seen that in some like, you know, once the craft cocktail boom started and like, there would be like sports bars, like sticking Slim Jims in their bottles of <laughs> McCormick's and be like, it's infused. Stop. That's so, when like, okay, craft cocktails have jumped the shark. It's right. over. Your no. needs have no business being in any kind of cocktail. Oh yeah. But anyway, back to your actual question. <laughs> um, I was, so I had, I was newly at Mixco and we hadn't opened any kind of kitchen there or anything yet. I was still, you know, just doing the bartending thing and focusing on that. But I got an email from Food Network about doing um, guys' grocery games. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which was, oh, man, I, like, had an existential crisis, the first of many, um, about whether or not I should do that show. But then I was like, you know, what? that's like a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Yeah, like, even fun. though. You know, everyone has relentlessly given me shit about my personal relationship with Guy Fieri. Since it was then. fun. It was fun. Um, it was a wonderful experience. And yeah, that was kind of my first foray into like the world of of televised cooking. <laughs> my mother called me and was like, Christina. I was like, yes. She's like, would Nico happen to be on the TV right now? <laughs> and I was like, are you watching Guy Ferrari? And she goes, yes. I said, that would be her. <laughs> it ha- it's the Halloween episode, so yes, they rerun which is it. perfect. I know it was kind of perfect, um, and they rerun it. They rerun it every year around That's Halloween, hilarious. and so then I, it's just a whole new crop of like it's been. This year will be ten years since that. Oh my and, gosh, it was that long ago. Yeah, and it still it comes back. It just won't go away. It's like a ghost that keeps haunting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, out of all of the TV appearances you have made, what has been your favorite? Um, One of the most recent ones, I mean, I'll say of the ones that have aired, because there are some things that haven't aired yet. Oh, I'm very excited. That are coming up that are going to be really cool, but um, like really, really cool. But um, the of the ones that are out, I think Searching for Soul Food was probably my favorite. That one's on Hulu. Um, and it, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know if I've seen this one. Oh my God. I know. I, <laughs> Tina. I know. I don't, searching for soul food. I don't think I've seen it. I thought the last one you were on was the uh, Chef's 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 Wild. Wild, which you totally got robbed on, and I don't believe any of it. <laughs> so um, we can definitely talk about Chefs versus Wild because that was an insane experience. It very challenging. Um, it was so hard. Um, but the chefs are, um, uh, searching for soul food. Searching for soul food is the chef Elisa Reynolds from okay. LA. She yeah. has a soul food restaurant yeah. in LA. It's kind of like like healthier versions of soul food. Okay. Um, and she got this show where she travels like all over the world in search of like visiting all these different communities and finding out what their version of soul food is. And just documenting that That's and like so cool. hooking with people and just learning about yeah. their connections with food. Awesome concept. Yes, and so, very um, much so. That came about, uh, I think that was like, I want to say the spring of 2022 that we filmed that. I know you've told me about it, but I didn't know that it was out yet. I yeah, think the last time we out. spoke, you said it hadn't been released yet, but you were yeah. excited about it. And I didn't know that it was out yet. 
I think it came out, it came out just this past year. Okay. Um, so, and it's definitely still up there. I think we're the second episode, but it was one of, you know, those that, um, you know, I've done a lot of this like kind of documentary stuff mm -hmm. and, um, you know, there's always a risk, especially when you're like representing the native community and right. there's a lot of misinformation or preconceived notions that people have or a story that they don't know that they're already trying to tell, even though, you know, like it's, it's so difficult. And I, I do, um, I'm compassionate toward filmmakers that are really trying to tell, uh, and, you know, allow people to tell their own story, but sure. a lot of times it just doesn't happen that way. Um, uh, and so I've had those experiences both mm -hmm. in print and in, you know, you know, um, video media and stuff where it's like, man, I thought I said all the right words and this still isn't coming off right, you know, right. but searching for soul food, like they were so intentional and the way that our story was presented, you know, it was myself and, um, two former board members of Burning Cedar Sovereign Wellness, um, and their families. And we were all out on Osage land in the springtime uh -huh. and we were, gathering wild onions and preparing this wild onion dinner, which is a, like a springtime, mm -hmm. you know, ritual that we have that sure. where we celebrate um, these Many springtime. Tribes do yeah, they? lots, mm -hmm. lots and lots of tribes in Oklahoma and Southeastern tribes, especially, but um, yeah, it, it was just a very meaningful meal to be able to present. And Elisa, like as the host did a great job of like, just allowing us to speak and tell our story without, putting any kind of like their own context on it right. that would take away from what we were trying to express. And so, man, I love the way that shit Okay, well, out. I'm watching it tonight. Watch that one. Well, the girls are staying the night at their grandmother's and Trey and I had discussed going out, but maybe we don't. And we just stay in and watch that. So. It's a good one. I'm going to watch it for yeah. sure. Okay. Um, and so in addition to cooking, landing you on TV shows, uh, I don't want to say in mo more recently because it's been a couple of years or a year plus has passed, but you were also the uh, private chef to Leo while he was for, uh, filming uh, Killers of Flower Moon here yes. in Oklahoma as well. So how was that? What was that like? That was um, like the spring and summer of 2021. Yes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, almost a couple of years. Yeah, it was. <laughs> or almost three years. Yeah. It almost seems like this like weird dream state that didn't really happen because it was so like, like, um, it was just this weird isolated moment of my life that, um, like there was really no interaction with anything else, you know? So it's very yeah, immersive. Yeah, because of COVID. Yeah. So we were coming right out of like full on lockdown. Um, and you know, I had lost my job at Duet and was on unemployment and just kind of like in general freaking out about what I was going to do uh -huh. um, and had decided like, okay, I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not just going to get another kitchen job or another restaurant job. I don't want to open my own place because that would be the worst possible time to do it's, that. It's yeah. not an option. And in, in the perfect situations, it's very hard. So. Yeah. So that was just not even on the table at all, even though I, I had already decided that wasn't something I wanted to pursue anymore. Um, and so I was just like, well, you know, I'll give just private catering a go and just start, you know, burning cedar indigenous foods as a catering company and see how it goes. And before, you know, it was like literally the day my unemployment was running out and nothing was back on, you know, I was doing right. like virtual cooking workshops and stuff, but sure. no one was, you know, having parties. So the catering business was not going to like sustain you. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and so I was like, well, what are we going to do for money right now <laughs> when this is the last check we're going to get? And like that day I got a, a DM from another chef who ended up being Scorsese's chef saying, Hey, what are you doing? Are you doing anything right now? Do you need you like, would you be open to, you know, wow, this 
random, like committing to a six month long contract. Like, actually, and I was yes. like, actually, <laughs> did Jesus send you? Because <laughs> yes, I would. Like, I was just really wondering how I was going to pay my rent. So that like came at the perfect possible time. So, uh, yeah, I just kind of got thrown into that world of like Hollywood descended in Oklahoma and like set up its own little universe that it was like, I know I'm in Tulsa and I'm like driving around Oklahoma, but I feel like my existence is like completely separate from normal life. Right. It's not normal for, you know, six full months. And then it was just over. That's so crazy. And it was like, they all get on planes and they all fly away. And you're just sitting there like, did that just happen? <laughs> what like, was the last six months? Was I literally just feeding yeah, like, it was wild. Romeo. I know. <laughs> Romeo. <laughs> you know, like. Um, yeah. And he um, he was very, like, down to earth. Like, that. you know, it's as much as you can be um, for a person that's been, like, super famous since they were 13. Oh, yeah. I mean. Um, so, like, uh, but, you know, I'll tell people, like, he wasn't by any means, like, normal. Right. You know, but he wasn't an asshole. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. I was very pleasantly surprised that I kind of thought it would be a situation where I would like make the plates and I would leave them on whatever table and I would like go hide, you know, <laughs> yeah, and right. let them eat and then be like, can I take your plate? Okay. You know, <laughs> but it was not like that at all. He like came home from a day of shooting and he would sit down at the kitchen, like at the, you know, kitchen island uh -huh. and be like, what's for dinner? Oh my God. You know, I, that sounds great. What's going in there? What are you doing? Oh, wow. Like, yeah. Just like kind of chatted up and asked me for recommendations on where to go and what to do. And he had family come in, you know, his entire family came and stayed multiple times and his girlfriend's family as, as well. So we would have like, you know, these full family dinners where like, you know, I'm randomly in a family photo with like his <laughs> former girlfriend and like all of her family and all of his family. That's crazy. It's really weird. What? Yeah. An interesting experience. Yeah. Right? Never in a million years did I imagine that like my career would end up there. That's and it's still, it just kind of really doesn't seem very real because it was like, it was um, like a very intensive, it was like, a you know, another boot camp because it was like there was a very strict diet that he had to stick to because he was trying to cut weight for the role. Oh, OK. <clears throat> he, you know, had gained a little COVID weight, as did we all. And <laughs> sure. the character um, of Ernest was really kind of supposed to be more like of this like kind of wiry, wily, uh -huh. you know, Oklahoma ranch hand type of guy. Right. Um and, you know, Leo was not in that particular shape at that time. And so, <laughs> like, I had him on a really restricted calorie diet, and it was all, like, low-inflammation foods. There was no red meat, no gluten, no sugar, no dairy. Oh, wow. Um, Chicken breast so, and broccoli. Yeah, it was super. And actually, not even broccoli. Like, there was, like, the whole, like, all the cabbage type of vegetables, like, no Brussels sprouts, no cabbage. Oh, Okay. Um, but kale was okay, but huh. Brussels sprouts weren't, it was a very odd diet. Is it was it just because of the, um, like too heavy in fiber or something. I don't know. I have no clue. Very uh, interesting. It was, um, it was put to, it was like formulated by a nutritionist in LA that he had seen. And so he had like blood work done and uh -huh. had this, like, um, this diet plan put together based on his, you know, all of his levels. Right. And so I had these, this like guideline of red light, yellow light, green light foods where it was like, you know, green light, he can eat as much as he wants of these yellow light, you know, occasional in like moderation. Twice a week. Yeah. And then like red light was absolutely never. Right. Um, and so it was really, really challenging. Like it pushed me. And of course, you know, so you have these limitations of what you can cook and all of his favorite foods are the opposite of all the things that he's supposed to be eating. <laughs> right. He really wants like gravies and sauces and meat and potatoes. You know, he was like right. a red meat and potato kind of guy. With, right. Like extra like blue cheese sauce all over it. And then I'm like, oh. can't give you any of that. Um, 
how's fish again? <laughs> and so I, I really it did. It was really good for me creatively because like I didn't feed him the same meal twice in like six months. You know, oh, I made wow. him something. I, there were a couple that I repeated because he liked them so much. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the most part, I just tried all new things every single day was like coming up with something new and lots and lots of research. And it really helped me like um, doing all that research in like what I do now, which is really focused on wellness and healing through food. Right. Like learning about all of like these inflammatory foods and all of the different ways that you can, um, you know, heal your body with food. With food, yes. Was it like a lot of that real deep research started during that period because I had nothing to do but like figure out what. That's awesome. What to feed Leo for dinner. Right. And how to make it really delicious, but still. Um, Mindful and help and healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, I didn't want, you know, there was never any like preservatives. Everything mm -hmm. had to be like made completely from scratch and no. Um, no prepackaged anything. It was all, right. you know, very much, um, you know, the highest possible quality. Well, fast forwarding a little bit, since we're talking about burning cedar mm -hmm. and what you're doing now, um, what, tell us a little bit more about burning cedar and it's like goal slash mission. Like what, it, what, why is it in existence? Why did you feel the need to bring it to your community? So, Burning Cedar Sovereign Wellness is a an intertribal community wellness center. Okay. So <clears throat> intertribal meaning this is a place for people from all different tribes. It's okay. not um, affiliated with any one tribe. You know, I'm Cherokee, um, but all of the people that come and gather here and that are a part of this place are from all these different nations and bring all their different respective, you know, culture and knowledge and um, history to this place where we can all share it. And the idea is that this is a gathering place where people can access those traditional ways of eating and traditional wellness practices that we've been removed from um, through colonization. You know, we sure. have all um, to some degree, you know, some more than others, but we've all lost a connection to our food sources and our our traditional food systems were disrupted due to colonization and removal right. um, and being removed from our ancestral lands. And then for a lot of us living in the city, it isn't even further removal because now we're in this urban space and we don't have access to land mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily have the ways um, of healing that we might in rural areas where there's a lot more opportunities to go for these foraging hikes and walks and, right. you know, observe the changing seasons and be able to eat and provide your own food in a sustainable way. Like that, there's a barrier to that here in the urban area. And so mm -hmm. that is the void that we're trying to fill with this space is to take all of that knowledge and all of that reconnection that's happening at the rural centers of our tribes and then have a hub for it in the city where we can be this model of like urban sustainability and reconnection to our traditional foods and our traditional um, wellness practices which you know that could be anything from like plant medicine to okay. um, just like crafts and storytelling yeah and all of those things are healing in ways that like we don't think about wellness nowadays because in modern society and like western medicine it's all about like pharmaceuticals and uh -huh. you know what are how are we like how are we managing these symptoms that we all have but indigenous knowledge tells us that there are deeper roots to the issues that we're having and yes a, a huge part of it is diet a huge right. part of it is our our lifestyle you know we're a lot more sedentary these days um you know we're not out there like hunting and foraging and right. cultivating the land so of course we're not like expending 5000 calories a day doing that right. that's a huge difference from the way our ancestors lived but beyond that we're disconnected from each other. We're disconnected from our songs and our dances and our stories mm -hmm. and um, and 
the multiple generations that used to exist, coexist and share knowledge and share insights. And, um, you know, the young ones keep us young and the old ones teach us everything that they have have accumulated all that knowledge over their lifetime. Or- and our ancestors lived with all of those people together. And nowadays we don't necessarily have that as much. And right. so all of those things are healing um, mind, body, and soul. Yeah. Yeah. Like we, we kind of adhere to, um, this, um, this medicine wheel concept that is not specifically like a Cherokee or Southeastern, um, uh, like tradition. It actually comes from, um, from up North, but it's something that reflects a lot of indigenous, um, like native North American teachings about wellness, which is that wellness is a balance between your physical, spiritual, uh, mental, and emotional health. I love that. Yeah. And so, you know, when we're only focusing on our physical health, right, when we're trying to treat ourselves with pharmaceuticals or, you know, just exercise, Mm -hmm. then, you know, you kind of see this medicine wheel that's like this circle with a cross in the middle Yes. And it's, it's these yeah. four quadrants, right? And so we, like, we envision that. And if you're f- putting everything on the physical side of things, you know, it's this, it's this movable your wheels kind of balance. balance. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe your emotional health or your mental health or your spiritual health are suffering. You're not going to feel well, even if you are working out every day and eating this organic, low carb you know, paleo, whatever you want to do, diet. Right. Um, if you're not taking care of your spiritual health or if your relationships are not healthy, then you are still going to feel like unwell. Unwell. Yeah. And so that's the idea is that this can be a place where we can explore that together. How do we how do we balance that wheel out? What are all the ways that we can learn to do that? specifically living in the city because it's so much harder to do when we're here. You know, this is so, this is like the furthest you can get from the way that our ancestors lived. Right. You know, surrounded by concrete and invasive species and like, you know, just, just lawns and, and parking lots and everybody in their own little pollution places, you know, pollution, all of it, all of that. So trying to just help people reconnect to things that will make them feel better in a a more holistic way. That's very cool. That's very, very cool. It's been really Give me an example of like a program that you've done here that is um, like pushing that and bringing it to the community to where they can come and feel some sense of wellness with something you're doing. Like, for example, the other day I saw on your social media that you're looking for uh, uh, volunteers for your (laughs) uh, introduction of ducks that are coming soon. Yes. So, yeah, that's an upcoming one. Um, You know, we've we opened the center in September of last year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had a a couple months where we were able to, you know, do some programming here. And it's been things like um, cooking workshops. Okay. Um, Which is huge. I think that, yeah, that's, I mean, that's my, my wheelhouse, right? Is like, I'm, I'm the resident chef in addition to being the executive director, just like, you know, kind of trying to figure out what all of this is. But my contribution is like the cooking workshops. And we do, um, one of the ones that we started all the way at the very beginning of the organization in the beginning of 2023 was our Sunday soup groups. Um, and it's like the last Sunday of every month, there's a, a particular soup that we'll learn. It'll, you know, usually have um, some kind of traditional indigenous ingredient. Mm-hmm. It'll always be something that's healthy, and usually made in one pot. You know, we try and keep it like one I Dutch love oven the old recipe. Pot yeah. recipe. Just something really accessible, something that it's like, you know, that ties to some other aspect of wellness that we want to reintroduce to our lives. Yeah. So it's like maybe this is squash soup from the squash that your neighbor grew. Mm-hmm. You didn't, maybe you didn't grow it, but somebody gifts this to you or you right. get it at the farmer's market. Yeah. You know, um, that's something that's seasonal that you can save the seeds from it. So we're like making mm-hmm. the soup, but we're learning to save the seeds so that you can plant them next fall. Right. Or plant them in the spring. 
Um, and then, you know, you're learning how this entire pumpkin is going to make like either enough soup for like 30 people or you, you know, learn to preserve that. So we're going to use part of it for the soup today and then we're going to process the rest of it and freeze it. Right. Or, you know, dry it. Right. Um, there's just lots of things that you can build on. And then, you know, maybe we'll learn, um, you know, a story that goes along with yeah. that particular squash because, that's another significant thing about our traditional indigenous foods is that they all have these stories with them that go all the way back to like some of them are tied to our origin origin stories. Mm -hmm. So it's it very much grounds you and like fills that it can fill that spiritual part of you. It can fill the mental part of you because you're learning a new skill. Right. It can fill the emotional part of you because like stirring a pot of soup and like giving it to someone to help them feel good. That yeah. makes you feel good. It, yeah. So it's like, it's just hitting all those marks. And then physically it's a healthy soup. Right. You know, so that's a, you know, an example of one that, that we've been doing and, and, you know, cooking classes, I think will always be at the heart of this place. Cause that's just my deal. <laughs> well, and I think cooking and food is, is, has been like, um, cornerstone of preserving culture yeah through like all of time yeah like, and not just beginning. for yeah not just for native people but like food has such an emotional impact um it's st you store memories yes. with your sense Absolutely. of smell and with that taste so yes. like yeah that i mean there's so many different ways that food can heal you and um so that's why it's like it's at the heart of everything we do here. You know, right. like we'll have movie nights and stuff. Like we have a movie night coming up um, at the end of this month and we're going to watch um, this new film that's out. It's called Fry Bread Face and Me. Yes. And I actually haven't seen it yet. Everyone I know has already seen it. And I'm like, is it too late to do a movie night with this? Because <laughs> I've been saving it for myself, but I know like the, uh, you know, all the people that I've talked to that have watched it have already seen it multiple times and right. have also said, oh, we're coming to movie night too. Oh, well, that's great. But, yeah. And, and so it's one that like is great for the whole family, it tells an indigenous story by an indigenous filmmaker telling their own story. And then we get to like have fry bread and chili while we watch it together. So sounds awesome. You know, just trying to find any excuse we can to like get people together and whether it's like sharing a meal or maybe we just have like some tea and snacks, you know. Yeah. Um, the ducks you mentioned. <laughs> um, I love that you sent me the agenda of like potential things we would talk about. And it just said like ducks, lol. <laughs> <laughs> because I love to talk about ducks. Ducks are awesome. They are amazing. I'm super excited um, for this spring. We have huge, huge plans, like probably overextending my capacity plans but we're gonna do it anyway because we're gonna like have all of these people to help us hopefully. that's right you're gonna have um, so many volunteers yeah so we're kind of putting together like these series of volunteer days as we put projects together so i've got like this duck house pieces that i have in my office right now in boxes <laughs> um it's actually like a kid's playhouse that i'm converting into a duck house i bet you it'll be perfect it's gonna be awesome yeah it's like just the right size it's got like the cute sliding barn door that has like you know the dutch door where it's like opens half and half uh -huh. but we're gonna turn it upside down so that the ducks can walk in on Perfect. the bottom part it's gonna be cool so we're like building a little mini patio to be the platform for that on one day and then um, we're gonna put the duck house together and so that'll be done this month and then hopefully in march we'll have ducklings to put in there the little ducklings and then that'll just be another kind of example of like urban food sovereignty which is these um you know we're all about like reestablishing these relationships with our food and our food sources right. and the land and the plants and the water you know our ancestors were so very connected they were immersed there was no separation between themselves and the plants and the animals and the no. plant. They were completely like one. And us being removed from that has made us sick in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, to put it like super simplistically. Sure. But any way that we can like reconnect is just a really good example of um, of rebuilding that 
relationship. And so that was the idea behind these ducks, aside from them being like adorable friends. <laughs> um, they There's a relationship there where they take care of a lot of the pests that we would have to worry about on the garden. They're going to be taking care of the slugs and the snails right. and all the bugs that are going to be, you know, inevitably attacking the garden. Mm -hmm. The ducks take care of that and we feed the ducks and they feed us with their eggs. Yes. And we, you know, and they fertilize everything constantly yep. you know they'll be building compost every day with the you know hay that we rake out of the duck house so mm -hmm. all of those things are like this example of how you can build this little ecosystem within that, urban settings yeah within an urban setting yeah um you know like i i have had the the privilege to get to to know sean sherman quite yes. well and one of my favorite things that he says in his talk is he always has this section where he's like, lawns are fucking stupid. This is true. This is true. <laughs> and, and then everyone goes, yeah. 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 And I'm like, y'all are cheering, but I know you're going to go and mow your lawn. Like, <laughs> right. rip it out and yes. put in food. Yes. Put in pollinators. Like, I've put in some wilderness. Yeah, I've looked into this because I've been wanting to do a uh, front yard garden for like a really long time because mm -hmm. our front yard is way larger than our backyard. And our backyard, our dog, you know, is that's yeah. like her area, you know, <laughs> and she makes it very well known that it is hers. Mm -hmm. And I have a garden back there that she and I are constantly going back and forth on. She say you're, she's supposed to stay out of it, but she thinks she's supposed to play in it. And it irritates me beyond any... <laughs> thing I can ever possibly describe to you. So I've always wanted to do it and I've looked into it and you have yeah. to have like, uh, the city of Tulsa requires six feet perimeter of around your yard where you cannot go into it for, I guess, purposes of seeing just like when you're building a fence or something, they're supposed to be, I don't know. That's what I was told. Sounds dumb. And also I uh, agreed. Agreed. Dumb. And a friend of mine, she was also doing a front yard garden mm -hmm. and uh, the city came and cited her for it because apparently her garden was too close to the sidewalk. Interesting. Yes. Do I need to? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that question is yes. Um, there's a committee forming in my brain already. Perfect. I know just the people to talk to about that. Yes. You just give me a few months and I'll take care of it. <laughs> no, take care of it. <laughs> oh my God. That's like just beyond. There are so many obstacles to this. There I really know. Are. It's just silly. It's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. It can be really overwhelming. And like, I could kind of so hear easy that. to just say, okay, whatever. Yeah. And, and move on. It's just, um, it's, it feels like a constant fight and it, you know, it's interesting. I, I really loved listening to um, the last episode and you talking with Trevor, um, how like how insightful he was speaking about like just how climate change affects us yeah. on so many different levels and it continues to get worse. I and think it's like, specifically the food industry more yeah, than anything. If we can't really grow difficult. food, how are we feeding people? Yeah. How so. are we going to feed ourselves? And it's a much more like urgent in this lifetime issue than I think a lot of people realize, Agreed. um, unless you are in direct, um, you know, I think as chefs and restaurateurs, we have a more direct line to the food systems than mm -hmm. people just shopping at grocery stores. And mm -hmm. we really see what's happening and we see the price fluctuations in a lot bigger way. We see the availability changes in a lot bigger way than you do at the grocery store. That's the last place that's always affected. Yeah. Um, but we see it on the back end here. And I work a lot with like the Indian agriculture or the intertribal agriculture council and like the Indian farm bill in trying to get more native people and tribes involved in farming and agriculture, because, um, you know, our ancestral knowledge that we have is the only thing that is going to get us out of the situation, that right. we're in, which is that we have created a food system that will not, it, it won't last. It's not sustainable. It is completely stripping the land of the any nutrients. kind of resources. Yes. And the foods that we're producing are not food. Right. No, it's not. <laughs> They're completely devoid of nutrients. I mean, you can eat, you know, a, you can eat pounds and pounds of broccoli and you're not actually getting any of the vitamins and minerals that like you you think that you're getting. No, not at Compared all. Compared to the way that 
um, you know, the, the diversity of foods that we ate less than a hundred years ago, mm-hmm. the quality of foods that are, you know, our families were eating less than a hundred years ago, mm-hmm. the change has been drastic and the nutritional density is the most like scary underlying thing that is causing all of these health problems, not just in any country, but across, no, across nationwide. the nation. Yes, absolutely. Everyone is, is deficient and, and people will be like, well, I'm like eating this plant-based diet and I'm like still I'm, not feeling I'm enough. shopping at Whole Foods. I'm spending my whole paycheck on, right. on all of these organic, you know, and it's like, but it's still not, it's not enough because even those foods have been engineered for Process. commercial reasons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you commodify something like that, it takes all of the, um, in tr- like the nutritional value out of it. Right. And so that is where we're coming back here and saying like, let's grow our own, let's grow these ancestral seeds that our ancestors left for us mm-hmm. because they haven't been, you know, GMO. Yeah. yeah they they're not. Been, and, you know, it's it's really frustrating because, like, even when you buy the stuff that's non-GMO, it's still been well. Yeah, it's been modified over the course of time. Yeah, it's just being documented. So yeah, just the just the way that the industry has gone, um, the the capitalism of the food industry has made it so that, like, just like with any product, you want to produce it. Um, a quicker, mm-hmm. larger, greater quantities, mm-hmm. and so that it costs you less money and you can charge more money for right. it. You know, like it's just right. profit driven. And when it's profit driven, it that everything else goes by the wayside. And so, yeah. exactly. I could spend hours talking about this subject yes. because I think that's something that you and I share in common. I am majorly passionate about. Uh, the agriculture side of growing food Mm -hmm. and uh, feeding people. And I think it's very important uh, that folks start gardening again. It's crucial. It's the only way. And we have this, this, you know, concept um, in native culture. And I hate to say that in such a blanket way because, you know, there is no like pan Indian, you know, universal native culture, but this is a belief that is shared um, universally, across, you know, across all of these different tribes and cultural backgrounds. And it's this seven generations concept. And it is the lack of that foresight is why we're in the food situation that we're in today. And getting back to this, like this, um, perspective on, on the future is the only way that we can move forward. And that is that, Every decision that you make today needs to be for seven generations in the future. So, you know, I know that I, in my lifetime, am not going to probably fix my own body. Right. And I'm not going to even fix, you know, my children or grandchildren. But everything that I'm trying to do is so that we have the things in place that that seventh generation is going to need. Right. And I love that. We lost that along the way somewhere because everyone was thinking about profit in the moment Mm -hmm. and in that life, you know, in their own lifetime and not thinking about the repercussions that were going to happen seven generations down the road. And then here we are and we're like, well, I wish someone had been thinking about me seven generations, seven generations ago. Yeah. Um, And so that's how we have to move forward is thinking about agriculture in a way that, might not directly benefit us today. It's not going to reverse climate change overnight. Well, it can't be fixed overnight. Yeah. No. I mean, it took a long time to, I mean, not that long to do this damage. <laughs> it really hasn't been that long. Yeah. Um, but it will take a lot longer to fix it. Yeah. You know, there's I'm, this really good book that you would love. Um, and it's called The Dorito Effect. Oh, okay. Um, it's all about the flavor industry. Oh. And about how artificial flavoring and just artificial foods in general have 
tricked our bodies into yes. believing that they're getting nutrients that they're not getting. Right. And, and, causing, and, and tricked our body to crave these. Yes. These flavors. Yeah. 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 It is. Um, It's going to make you really mad. I had to like take, <laughs> take breaks from it. It's like infuriating, but it's a lot of really good information. Okay. Yes. I will definitely, you said it's the Dorito, what? The Dorito effect. Dorito effect. Okay. I will look into it for sure. Well, I, like I said, I could spend forever talking to you about yes. this subject and I think maybe we need to schedule a coffee date soon so yes. we can carry that. on. Um, but I, I do hang out with people when there aren't microphones. Oh, do you? Sometimes. Okay. I prefer a microphone. Um, <laughs> cause like if I'm just not talking and I can't go back and listen to it, like why am I even doing it? But I guess we could hang out. Yeah, we could. I think you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You like me a little bit and I like I you. So I think coffee date is in order. Yeah, absolutely. I forgot a very crucial thing to ask as part of every episode. The world needs to know this. I stayed <laughs> up all night racking my brain right. for my very best tip. Right, your pro tip. Tell us, Nico, this is what my pro is it? tip. And it's hilarious because it's like I'm supposed to be um, this proponent of um, healthy indigenous mm -hmm. foods. And I'm like, so butter, guys. Let's talk um, butter. Butter, I always keep a pound of butter in the freezer um, and I use it to make like biscuits or uh, pastry dough, dumplings, anything like that, where the recipe calls for you to like cut in the butter or use fold your fingers. In. Yeah, use your fingers to like fold it in <laughs> or use your fingers to like, uh, you know, crumble the butter in. Yeah. Um, which always warms up the butter right. and you don't end up with flaky as much as you could. What I use is a cheese grater and mm -hmm. I take that frozen butter and I grate it and it's super fast and easy. And then you've got all the butter in these perfect sizes to just toss with your flour. That's right. And then, you know, add your water, buttermilk, whatever you're going to do. Perfect flaky biscuits. Perfect flaky biscuits. And, uh, and don't overwork your dough. Don't overwork the dough. That That's is right. the other thing is like, you know, when you're working that butter into the flour, you could go too far. You could end up with too big of lumps. Right. Lots of margin for error there. But when you grate it in, all you do is like toss it until each little piece of butter is coated in flour. Right. And that's it. And then you add your liquid just enough to get it to come together. And you really eliminate a lot of the amount of like, you know, manhandling that you do on the dough. And it makes for everything to be so much more tender and flaky and rise better and all the things. That's right. You've heard it here. Pro tip to Chef Nico. But butter's bad for you. <laughs> butter's bad for you. <laughs> I, although I will say, like, some butter, if you're getting quality butter, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, not saying that we just toss it in everything, but I'm saying it can right. have some I nutritional mean, benefits. You got to have biscuits on a Sunday every once, once in a while. Every once in a while. Just right. Just got to live. Right. And you can't live your life without Eggs Benedict, which requires a lot of butter. That is Not true. quite the same style and technique of a flaky biscuit. However, it That's does true. require a lot of butter. Okay. That's all the time we have for today's episode. And you know that I am one of your largest fans and I'm always rooting for you. you. I always want to see you do well. I think um, more women supporting women um, is crucial. And I want my daughters to know that. And I think Absolutely. our friendship is something amazing and I cherish it with everything I have. Um, but... Tune in, friends, next week, and I will be speaking to another dear friend of mine um, and getting his perspective of the future of the industry from the front of the house. Ooh. Ooh. Who is it? I can't I tell you. <laughs> well, I guess we could end it on a, a note of the Butter Queen herself and just say bon appetit. <laughs> yes? Yes. Okay. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. Bon appetit.